Soviet Union? Yes. United Kingdom? Abstain. The United States? Yes. Resolution Paraguay? of the Duck yes. Committee for Palestine was adopted by 33 votes, 13 against, 10 abstentions. Resolution 181 in the United Nations General Assembly in 1947 paved the way for the rebirth of the State of Israel in 1948. However, did this give Israel legitimacy? The answer is no. Generally speaking, in international law, General Assembly resolutions are not binding. It's a, a, a wide myth. There is absolutely no truth that Israel's legal foundation is based on the UN Partition Resolution of uh, November 29, 1947. If the Jewish people and the Arabs had agreed to enter into a treaty based on the terms of resolution, then rights and obligations could have been created in international law. But that didn't happen. The legal foundation of modern Israel really is initially traced back to the period right after the First World War when the great powers at the time and the League of Nations, which was the UN of the, that particular period, had to decide what's going to happen to various former enemy territories. Howard Grief began practicing law in 1966. For many years, even before that, he had an interest in Middle East affairs. In the 1980s, he began to examine long-hidden documents in the British National Archives that minuted the San Remo Conference of 1920. As a result, he published the book The Legal Foundation and Borders of Israel Under International Law. The San Remo Resolution, that is the basic constitutional document of the State of Israel under international law. San Remo, the Villa de Vacha. This is the place where legal rights were granted. This is the place where legal rights were given to both the Jewish people and the Arab people. Dr. Jacques Gauthier is an international human rights lawyer. For more than 25 years, his focus has been the legal status of Jerusalem under international law which was the subject of his doctoral thesis. It's in this place that the leaders with the power to make binding dispositions with respect to the Ottoman territories deliberated and made the decision, having heard claims from the Zionist organization in Paris in 1919 during the Paris Peace Conference, having heard submissions from the Arab delegation in respect to what they wanted in the Ottoman territories. Having heard these submissions, a group of them gathered here and made final binding decisions in international law as to who would get what. At San Remo, that what had been exclusively a British approach receives the full backing of the international community. And in that sense, uh, Israel's legitimacy is linked to an international decision at San Remo and not just a whim of British policy. In 1917, Lord Allenby conquered the Holy Land and the Jews were promised a national home in Palestine by the Earl of Balfour, a policy endorsed by Woodrow Wilson and by the League of Nations, which made Palestine a British mandate. In the 1922 Palestine Mandate, the League of Nations together voted on a very special resolution. It decided that they would give recognition to the historic rights of the Jewish people. To do what? To reconstitute their national home. If you look at that language, you see two things. You see they are recognizing a pre-existing right and not creating a new right. In other words, the historical rights of the Jewish people to this land were recognized by the great powers at the time, by the equivalent of the UN at the time. It was the Jewish people that were chosen to be the beneficiaries of a trust, a mandate under the care of the British government in respect to Palestine. 
it was the in Arab inhabitants of the territories of Mesopotamia, Iraq now, Syria and Lebanon that were chosen to be the beneficiaries of a trust or a mandate. Part of it under the trusteeship of or mandate of the French, Syria and Lebanon, part of it under British supervision, Mesopotamia. I want to underline that the primary objective of the mandate for Palestine was to grant political rights and respect to Palestine to the Jewish people. The civil and religious rights of the Arabs as individuals were fully protected in the uh, mandate document. But insofar as the national and collective rights and the collective political rights um, uh, were concerned, these were reserved exclusively for the Jewish people because uh, the Arabs were given those same rights, not in Palestine, but in the neighboring countries. And that is why today you have 21 Arab states and one Jewish state. The Second World War brought about the demise of the League of Nations. It was superseded by the United Nations in 1945. The Charter of the United Nations, which you are now signing, is a solid structure upon which we can build for a better world. How does this affect the rights of the Jewish people under international law? In the final resolution passed by the League in April of 1946, it is specified that the intent is that after the dissolution of the League, it is necessary to continue to look after the well-being and the development of the people concerned in each mandate. And for Palestine, that meant the Jewish people. So the rights that were recognized as inhering in the Jewish people uh, were preserved by Article 80. There's nothing in the Charter which is to be construed in or by itself as taking away or altering the rights given to any people prior to the establishment of the United Nations. And I refer, for instance, to Article 8 of the Charter. Following Israel's statehood in 1948, the country was invaded by five Arab armies intending to destroy the Jewish state. The eastern part of Jerusalem was annexed by Jordan. The city was divided for 19 years. Jordan's sovereignty over the West Bank and Jerusalem was never recognized by the United Nations. In 1967, Israel recaptured East Jerusalem in a war of defense and later annexed it. The Security Council Resolution 242 of November 22, 1967 is often referred to as uh, the source of rights and obligations for the parties in the Middle East. If I focus on Jerusalem, I take the position that, again, rights have been granted based on the recognition of historical rights, based on the principle of reconstituting what the Jewish people used to have. The Jewish state and the Jewish people have done nothing to relinquish, surrender the rights that were given in respect to that territory. Anyone who looks at the census data back in the 19th century when the Ottoman Empire was here will realize that the Jewish people already in the 19th century had restored a majority in Jerusalem, in the old city of Jerusalem. Uh, in 1864, the British consulate in Jerusalem actually provided some census data. And they said out of 15,000 residents in Jerusalem in 1863, 8,000 were Jewish. So we're speaking about a city that has been a Jewish city since Ottoman times, since the mid 19th century. The old city is without doubt uh, the most uh, controversial, the most sought after, the most contentious issue when one speaks of the question of Jerusalem. You have to remember that uh, until the middle of the 19th century, 
Jerusalem was the old city. Many who tell Israel to redivide Jerusalem along the 67 lines and therefore placing the whole old city on the Palestinian Arab side forget what happened in 1948. 1948, Jerusalem was invaded by five Arab armies. There were UN guarantees that there'd be an international city. The UN didn't do anything. Finally, all the Jews of the old city of Jerusalem were ethnically cleansed, forced to leave, and the Arab Legion, along with Palestinian locals, destroyed 55 synagogues and Talmudic academies. They're blown up. Anyone who says to Israel, give up on Jerusalem, has to explain how we'll avoid that history repeating itself. Remember, from 1948 till 1967, when Israel reunited Jerusalem, Jews were not allowed to visit the Western Wall. And that is something that Israel is determined to avoid. After 18 years of a failed peace process, in which there is no agreement in sight, the Palestinian Authority has indicated that it will unilaterally seek recognition from the United Nations General Assembly for a Palestinian state within the pre-1967 Green Line and with East Jerusalem as its capital. The Green Line was simply an armistice line. This is the line chosen between Israel and the Jewish people and the Jordanians when they stopped fighting in 1948-1949. That line, it is specified in the treaty, in the armistice agreement between Israel and Jordan, was never intended to be for anyone the source of rights and obligations. The original Oslo agreements, the first one in 1993, the big Oslo agreement in 1995 known as the interim agreement, had a clause in them. It was called Article 31. And it said, neither side shall change the status of the West Bank and Gaza Strip prior to the completion of the permanent status negotiations. If the Palestinians try and change the status of the territory without negotiating with Israel, that is a unilateral act which violates this commitment. Now, why is this particularly important for Europe? Because when the interim agreement was signed with that critical clause, at the White House, in the presence of President Clinton, the European Union signed the agreement as well as a witness. And therefore, if EU countries decide to support the Palestinian move in the UN in contravention of that Palestinian commitment in Oslo, what they're essentially doing is lending a hand to a violation of a written agreement to which they've also, they are also signatories. So the immediate question in Israel will be, who would ever rely on the European Union again to be involved in the peace process if it violates the very agreements that it itself signed? The whole world is saying to Israel, well, why don't you recognize the rights of the Palestinians to a Palestinian state? It seems elementary, and Israelis hear this all the time. But put the shoe on the other foot. Do you see anybody telling the Palestinians, you must recognize the rights of the Jewish people to a nation state of their own, whose roots are in international legitimacy and international proposals going back to San Remo and to the British uh, mandate by the League of Nations. Unfortunately, that same demand is not made of the other side and perhaps exposes its real intent. Many gathered here in Rome, senators, uh, members of parliament, to discuss issues relating to the peace process. Yes, many are concerned about decisions that the nations could be making in the coming weeks and months relating to the rights of the Jewish people, the rights of the State of Israel in respect to Jerusalem, in respect to disputed territories. In order to give peace a chance, it is necessary to honor the solemn pledges made under the law of nations to the Jewish people in the State of Israel.